Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's two o'clock, so we will get started with uh, this afternoon's webinar where we're going to be looking at building a barn with Advanced Steel and the Greytech Power Pack. Um, as always, before we get started, could someone just confirm in the chat window that you can uh, hear me, you can see my screen, and you can actually see me okay today? Excellent, thank you, uh, Ilias. Okay, um, today's webinar, you probably noticed when you were logging in, is using Teams. Um, so this is the first time we've done a Teams webinar or webinar using Teams. So if anything does go wrong, please just let me know and we'll see if we've got any technical issues. We will try and resolve it as we are going along. Uh, so my name's Rob Merriman. I'm one of the application engineers here in the structures team. Now, one thing you should all be able to do with the way that we're doing this Teams webinar today, where you have my email address, my LinkedIn profile and my Twitter handle, you should be able to actually click on that within the presentation um, and that will take you to either my email or my LinkedIn or my Twitter. Uh, so you can do that in a web browser and then you can interact interact with me uh, separately after the event. Uh, so I have 12 year, years of experience in the construction industry. Eight years of that was as an architectural metalwork and steelwork draftsman using advanced steel. Over that time, I worked in two subcontract drawing offices, which allowed me to work on various projects across multiple different steelwork sectors. So over that time, probably worked with about 20 to 30 different uh, fabricators. So I currently work as a structures application engineer for Greytech UK, drawing on that first hand industry experience um, and then uh, provide technical uh, support, customization, training uh, and implementation for structural CAD packages. The focus is predominantly on advanced steel, but with advanced steel being added to the AEC collection, um, we do also look at AutoCAD, Revit, Navisworks, Recap and Fusion 360 for our renderings. A little bit about Greytech. Um, so we are 30 years old, uh, headquartered in France. We operate through 48 offices. Uh, we are healthy, profitable and growing, and we are quickly becoming one of the largest Autodesk partners worldwide. Uh, we've got over 550 staff, 100 of those are located in our research and development centre out in Romania. So those are the guys that are creating our own great tech products um, and power packs, um, which is obviously what we're going to be looking at today. And we are here to work with you guys and help you guys. So hundreds of thousands of projects are completed using Greytech software. Across our support, we have a 98% excellent or good feedback, and that's over 50,000 support cases per year. And across the whole world, we deliver more than 3,500 um, training courses. So why Greytech? Oh, gone too far there. So we are one of the only companies that can help or uh, we can um, help you to deliver your project across all areas of the project. So we have broken um, that down into four key pillars and they are create, simulate, fabricate and manage. So create is using the Autodesk products and enhancing them with the Greytech power packs, which is exactly what we're going to be looking at today. Simulate is then taking that BIM model and making sure it'll actually work in the real world environment. So we have our own structural analysis program called Advanced Design, which will look after the simulate pillar. Fabricate is then taking our BIM deliverables through to the finished fabricated product. Um, so obviously Advanced Deal has a foot in create and fabricate because we're producing that fabrication information. Uh, but we do also have products such as Advanced Workshop, 
and armor plus that will take care of your uh, fabricate stage and then finally we have the manage pillar uh, so all of the uh, all of the projects will produce uh, work in progress data and documentation and these days usually that needs um, collaborating with a common uh, an external sorry common data environment so we have great tech open tree that will do that for you just before we get into uh, today's session i just want to highlight to everyone the great tech learning materials that are available and out there so we'll start off with the content portals so all of our recorded webinars uh, get uploaded to our content portal um, like I said to the guys, some people have just joined me just now. This webinar is done through Teams, so you should be able to actually click on that on the link in the presentation and it will open it in the web browser for you to have a look at after the session has finished. So the Advanced Deal Content Portal has over 50 webinars now, um, so over 50 hours of um, extra learning and tips and tricks for you. Uh, we also have the blogs, so those have been running for over six years now. Um, so that's where me, Alec and John will produce tips and tricks and things like that. So again, you can click on the link there. For our Grey Tech customers, we have a dedicated portal called uh, Grey Tech Advantage. So this is where you can download your Grey Tech products, including the Advanced Deal Power Pack. And then for the Grey Tech events that we run, such as the annual BIM Up Conference, the Advanced Deal User Groups, um, the American Advanced Deal Academy, if you're a Grey Tech customer, you can watch those on demand using the Grey Tech Advantage site. So if you are a Grey Tech customer and you don't have um, access to it, uh, click the link and you'll be able to um, register there. Or if not, speak to your account manager or send me an email and we'll sort out um, an Advantage account for you. And then finally, there is our events page. Um, so that is all of our Grey Tech UK events. So um, obviously click the link to check out any upcoming events. For Advanced Deal users, we are running our UK Advanced Deal User Day on the 22nd and 29th of September this year. Um, due to COVID, it's still going to be an online event as it was last year. Um, but that is the registration is now live. So make sure you click on the link there and you register for the user day. I'm also going to try and run a poll. Just going to wait for it to pop up on my screen um, just to see. Do you guys use the Grey Tech learning materials? So you should now on your screen have a pop up. And with this poll, you can um, tick multiple answers. So you can tick your answers and then submit them. I'll let that run for 30 seconds or so. And I will close the poll there. So thank you very much for answering that. OK, so we are going to be talking about this today. Um, I just want to highlight the Advanced Deal Power Pack and what you get with the Power Pack. So the Advanced Deal Power Pack is Greatex add on to Advanced Deal. If you're a supported and maintained customer, it's free. That statement is true for the UK. If you're joining us from overseas or outside the UK, uh, just check with your local Grey Tech reseller um, as to what's included. We break the power pack down into five key areas. So we have our create macro. So that includes a structure designer, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Um, it creates that whole structure with one dialog box. We have the create connections. So there is our own dedicated advanced steel uh, connection vault, which gives you 25 new parametric connections. 
We then have our create macros, our elements. So we have things like the castellated beam creator, the folded plate extender, helical and spiral polylines and beam creators. Then we have our BIM import and export tools. So we are able to export the model assemblies or parts to ASIS, DWG, STEP or IGIS. Uh, we have a link to advanced workshop. We have a link to advanced design. We have an option to explode drawings. We do have a 3D PDF tool and we've got, if you're using Kingspan floor beams, we have a tool that will export to the Kingspan data. And then as well as all the tools that you get with, a pack, with the power pack, you do get additional data. Uh, so we've added extra sections such as cold roll suppliers, including Stedman's, Thomas Panels, Hadley's, certain Kingspan sections and steel sections. We've added some weld mesh and some perforated panels, and we've also added some ISO screws um, and things like half round square edge bars. Those have been added to the uh, to advanced steel via the power pack. OK, so today's session, we are going to be looking at building a barn in advanced steel. So we are going to look at the types of structure that we can create with the power pack structure designer. Then we'll move on to using the structure designer. Then we need to actually apply connections to that structure. We'll look at then doing a material list. And then finally, we'll look at sharing our model with your customers. Um, so the types of structure that we can create with the structure designer. So we can do curved roof structures. So all the pictures you see there are structures created with one dialogue with the structure designer. We can do mezzanine floors. Uh, we can do tapered beam structures, um, not as common in the UK, but fairly common uh, throughout Europe. Uh, single story one base structures. Single to story two base structures. So we're getting into the agricultural type buildings or single story multiple base structures. We can then move on to multi story one bay. Or multi story two bays or multi story um, multiple bays. So how does it all work? So the structure designer included with the Graytech power pack is one macro that will allow you to model all the members of your structure. So we can create a structure like that. Now, if you're doing repeatable buildings and say the uh, majority of your business is agricultural buildings and they're all a variation on a theme, once you set this up once, you can save all of the settings into a library and then you can use that on any future projects. Um, as we go through this, you'll see that the macro can't model everything and it doesn't have every option, but it will give you uh, a very strong starting point. Um, and our personal point of view is for setting out the basics, we don't think you can model it quicker manually, especially if you're going to be using it on multiple projects. Um, so what's going to happen next is uh, this. I have pre-recorded a video and we did use it in the BIM up conference. So I will be it will say that I'm doing it in 2021. Everything will still work in advanced deal 2022 and with the 2022 power pack. Um, Hopefully the video and the audio will play. If there are any issues, please let me know in the chat window. If I can't resolve them today, the session is being recorded and we will put it up on the content portal for you. So let's get cracking. Uh, I'm in Advanced Deal 2021. The 2022 Power Pack will be released uh, on the 1st of June. Uh, so I'm on the Power Pack tab. And I'm going to just use the default structure. This session is all about showing you how the structure designer works. So click the default structure button. And that will give us our little uh, portal frame. So as we looked at uh, in the presentation, if we go to the library, you can see the library entries that we have here for um, the different types of structure we can create. 
So I'm going to jump straight into the building definition. So this is where we can control the number of levels. And as you can see in the picture, that's obviously working vertically. The number of bays uh, is working in the X axis and the number of rows is working in the Y axis. So what we'll do in here, we'll just, we are going to do a barn or a, an agricultural shed. So we're going to set that the number of bays to eight. Then in the bay definition, this is where we can set our different centers. So at the moment, we've got five meters between every bay. If you don't want that, we can untick equal distance between rows and we can say, right, well, in here, we're going to make these. Let's make a couple of them six and a half meters. You'll know when the macro has done what it needs to do because it'll go and add the point and the two decimal places and the millimeter. So now we've got some unequal centers. The create transversal beam is the beam that spans between the nodes of the columns and the rafter. So if you want a beam in there, we can say create transversal beam and that will put the beams in there. We will talk about that uh, in a little bit. Then we're going to look at the portal frames. So the first tab uh, in this, uh, the first sub tab in this tab is the geometry. So you'll see in here we have all the pictures to show what's happening. So I'm going to make my span 12 and a half meters. We'll make the portal height uh, 8 meters. Now, what you need to look at here is at the moment that is now an unequal building because we have this option here, number four, and that's from the center of the column to the apex. So because my span is 12 and a half, I need to make this six and a quarter meters. And that will give me uh, an equal frame. And then you'll see that we have these drop downs. So for column heights, well, for all of the options uh, below this point, I have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. So we can have different values. Uh, so we'll just make my column heights on the left-hand side 6 metres. I don't want any extra projections. I'm going to leave my base plate level. So once I've set the left-hand side, I can click the drop-down here and say Copy to All. And that will copy those settings to the right-hand side. And if we go to the right hand side, you can see that it's copying from the left hand side. Uh, and that's why they're grayed out. If we wanted to edit, we would just click the editable button. Then we come to the frames tab. <coughs> and you'll see in here that we have, in our drop down, we have eight different frames because we have eight bays. So you could have different section sizes for each uh, bay if you needed. Uh, so what we're going to do, we are going to set this on frame, set everything up for frame one. And again, we've got column left side, column right side. So we're just going to come in here and we are going to choose UK Universal Columns for our columns. And we'll choose something like a 305. Where is your system line? So we'll set that in the... Uh, middle and the rafter we are going to set to a UK universal beam. Now what we need to do with the rafter once we've set a reasonable section size uh, we'll make these 305 165s. The system line of that rafter is set to middle. Now um, the system line in advanced deal is where our dimensions are driven from. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the system line position of the rafter to top just so that all my dimensions on the fabrication drawings run from the top of the rafter. What we have to do for the column, we want to copy to all so that that setting applies to the right hand side as well. Now, what we've done there is we've done that for frame one. So again, I want to click the drop down and choose copy to all. 
and that's just going to update every frame and we can check that by just clicking on a random frame and you can see that these are the same settings that we had on frame one then our transversal beams we will make this uh, we can make this a UK circular hollow section I suppose Can't see the wood for the trees. There we go. You go circular hot section. And we're just going to make this, let's say, 100. Now, the one thing to note with this is I'm going to, when I put a connection on, we're going to extend this uh, rafter up anyway. But this macro at the moment is putting this uh, transversal beam at the intersection between the system lines of the uh, rafter and the column. We could, if we wanted to, offset this 200, but because this tool, or minus 200, this tool uh, is the same tool that's in advanced design, and that adv in advanced design it's used for the structural analysis. The system lines need to be noding out, so what it does is it offsets the beam without moving the system line. So my advice if your system line isn't at this position then turn the transversal beams off within here and model them manually outside of the macro um, unless you have your system lines off in your drawings for example because at the moment in the UK build at least out of the box uh, all of those dimensions will go from wherever the system line is. Uh, we'll just work through uh, in here so we have gable post options Again, we can have different posts, and we can have, uh, sorry, we can have a post within each portal if we wanted. We can have different posts, so if we just want one on the left side, one on the right side, if we do total length. With this dialogue, it's all just about going through the options and then enabling uh, the different options within the macro. So I can say I want, yeah, we'll put four in. That will actually, for this example, that will work quite well. And we will put these in as UK Universal, put them in as UK Universal columns. And we'll make them all 152, 152. Um, again, these are the options that we have for the gable post. So if you need different uh, positioning, different spacings, different alignments, um, then just leave the option as disabled uh, and then model them outside of the macro. So I can go to portal 8 and I can say copy from portal 1 and you'll see at the back of the building that will then copy those uh, gable posts in. Then we'll look at the purlins in the roof. Uh, so again we can drive whether they are firstly enabled or disabled uh, so we'll leave them enabled this is one thing we need to look at in here there is you'll see in here that we have connect access to node now what that is doing is that is um, noding out the system line of the cold rolled with the system line of the rafter so if you don't want it noding out, because we're using this for uh, detailing, then we can set the system line where we want, and then we can add the uh, 8mm vertical offset that we need, and the system line will stay within inside the uh, purlin. We can then go to the advanced section, we can choose our first and last projections if we need them, but I'll do that within the joint. Uh, and then we're going to go and choose uh, what section we're going to use. I'm going to use, in the UK, a new supplier that was added via the power pack a couple of years ago. That's Thomas Panels. So we'll just put some Thomas Panels Z sections in there. and we'll make those 200. If we wanted these purlins then 
we tick the bottom to create East Perlins. I'm a little bit conscious of time for this session. So I'm just going to leave that as it is. Side rails are not turned on. So what we can do is we can, on the left hand side of the building, between portals one and two, so that's this area in here, we can enable the side rails. We can control what's happening in here. So maybe we've got uh, a wall. So we could say, well, actually, oh, I wanted to go the other way. I wasn't looking at the dialogue. So we'll start distance from the top is 300. End distance, we can say, let's put it at 1,250 because uh, we'll have. Uh, let's make it a little bit bigger. Let's put a three meter wall in there. So let's put it at 2,800. We'll put two and a half meter wall in there. And then we can say, well, we probably only need four side rails in there. I'm going to say, don't connect the axis to the node. What that did in there, if we tick that again, because the system line of the columns is set to center, what that's doing is that's putting the system line of these side rails onto the system line of the column. So I can untick this option in here, connect axis to node. I will leave that as it is. And what we'll do is we will, again, change this to Thomas panel C section. We'll just do Thomas panels all around. And then I want to rotate that 180 degrees. I'll put the system line at the bottom. Once we've got that one set up, what we can do between portals one and two, click the drop down, we can say copy to all. And that will copy to all on the left hand side. Then we can copy to all and that will copy those cold rub items to the right hand side. If we need to brace particular bays, we probably need to brace at least the end bays. Again, it's all just about enabling or disabling the bracings on the side and within the bays that you want. So we've got X bracing in there. We will keep it simple. Uh, but what we'll do is we will, let's look to change this. We'll make it flat bars and we'll make it So 80 by 12. That's good. Uh, the geometry in here. So then what we can do is for our offset from the top, we could bring that down, let's say 150. So it's away from our uh, transversal beams. Probably at the bottom will be okay because we'll put a base plate connection on in a minute. We'll connect that in. And that's all we need to do for that. So then I'm going to say we want that in base 7 to 8. And we will copy from portal 1 to 2. And we can copy that to the right hand side. So we've braced all four uh, corners as an example. Uh, same for the roof bracing. So exactly the same process. The one thing to note again, um, I'm going to enable it and then I'm just going to turn it off, is because I set the system lines for the rafters to the top, that will be putting um, the bracing wherever it finds a system line of the rafter. Now again, we could in here, uh, option number five, we could look to offset that maybe minus 150. But what you have to remember is it will leave the system lines behind. So again, that is going to come down to uh, you guys, whether you want to enable it within the macro uh, or not. Platforms is whether we are sort of creating like a mezzanine. Um, so we've got, we can create one on the front, on the rear. So I'll just create one uh, on the front. 
will enable it. Once it's enabled, then you can set the height. We can set the left and the right hand beam length. So we could, I suppose, if we wanted, have it offset. We can then control what beams are used uh, in the X and the Y, what their alignment is, what the section size is. If we want cantilevers, if we want corner columns, we can enable them. Marginal columns, we can enable them. So you can see in the picture here what the system is going to do. If you want secondary beams, you actually want some platform beams. If we enable the secondary beams, we can then control them in the X or the Y axis. So I think we should. I'm going to turn all this off in a second. But you can see the system putting those beams in. So we can create a little mezzanine and remember we can create one on the inside between particular portals so if we did want a portal in here between six and seven we can actually uh, enable that within there and then go through uh, those extra options in there so I'm just gonna go back and disable those we're just doing the basic uh, structure openings this is where it does start to get very clever we can create window openings we can create personal door frames or gate frames so just because we've got cold rolled on the side I'll create some between portals four to five so one two three four so in this area we can enable a window frame and if you enable these frames, it will automatically trim the cold rolled for you. The same if we did a personal door frame. Now we'll probably have to set the height of this to something like 4 meters. You can see the system is automatically trimming the cold rolled. If that post was to run up to the underside of what the system is calling the transversal beam that's where we could say create uh, continuous posts and that will run through up to that point uh, but again I'm just going to disable that and the system will put them back for us uh, intermediate beams is where we can create particular beams at particular height so actually if we said we wanted these a few hundred mil down, we could actually look to do it with these intermediate beams instead. Because what I can do is I can say the left hand side between portals one and two, I want to add a beam. And that will go and add a beam in there. Then we can go and look to change the section size. So in here we can set it to a Uh, we need to find the eye sections. Then we can go and change it to a UK universal beam. Just click in uh, one of the options in here and then we could set that oh, trigger happy to something like a 254146631. Then in the height we could then set the height to, what did we do, 6 meters. So if we said 5500, that is then putting that in there. So if you transversal beam, you can't get the height where you want it. We could do it with an additional beam. Then the alignment, we can look to control R. Uh, where that is aligned inside, centered, what it's doing within there. We could then copy that to all the portals if we want. We could then copy that to the right hand side. And then I'll just remove it as an example. The final option uh, in here is claddings. So the system knows everything that's going on in here so again 
it is just a case of enabling the claddings. We can then set the cladding sizes, the cladding profiles, what we're doing. We can create openings if we want. So if we said span one to two, or let's just put it in the middle, span five to six, we can enable the opening. That has our opening in there. And then you can see that we've got the start distance X, length, start distance Y, opening height. And if we want any, if we want array and how many copies. And again, once all of this is set up, we can then copy it to all if we wanted to. So this whole macro is just about enabling and disabling the options. If the macro won't do what you want it to do, then we'll create it outside of the macro like we would have had to do manually anyway. But what we can do in here is I can save this as, let's say, BIM up. And if your company are doing these types of agricultural buildings and they are a repeat on a theme, once you've got a library entry set up with the section sizes um, and your cold roll supplier and where you want your bracings, this will save that entry into the library and then we can use that on every uh, single project and then we can manipulate from there. So we'll just wait for it to actually save into the library. There we go, we have it in there. And if this was my company standard, I can tick the box and say, set as default. I can come and start a new template. And let's go to a southwest isometric and realistic. And then if we click the uh, default structure using the structure designer, that will start with what I've just spent 15-20 uh, minutes creating. So once you have your library entry, the system will use that obviously as what it starts with. And there is my shed and we can say right well actually this one in here in this particular project is 15 bays. Okay, we'll have to copy around the purlins and things like that. So we would have to, again, do copy to all and start to adjust the, start to adjust the bracing positions and things like that. But we can very, very quickly come in here, start to change the span distances start to change the heights and things like that and all of this is going to update parametrically so if you guys have uh, two or three different shed designs that you use uh, to cover different spans and things you can set up two or three library entries um, and then we've got the basics of our model done so now we'll move on to um how to apply connections. So I would advise that when you're applying your connections, um, you apply them using the connection information, uh, the connection vault, and then you actually name your connections. Um, for certain type of connections, we can use the propagate joint command. Uh, it's new for advanced deal 2020 that will allow you to apply the connections very quickly. The only thing with this is, in some instances, the system can um, duplicate joints. So you need to be careful. In some uh, configurations, it works really well. Um, in others, uh, not so much. Um, and we will do a basic material takeoff. So we're looking at this project from the point of view of actually just quoting a job. So with the structure designer, we can get the basic frame in there quickly. With the propagate joint, we can get connections on relatively quickly. And then we need a material list. So we've got a fairly accurate tonnage um, for the job. So once we put the basic connections on, we can apply the numbering and then we can run a material list for a good estimate of the tonnage. And then finally, if you're actually sending a quote off um, to your client, 
rather than just giving them a material list and a tonnage and a price um, and a quote, it might be beneficial to actually share the model as well. Um, so you can use the shared view functionality and this will mean that anyone is able to view the model using a web browser, a tablet or a mobile. So we are about to go into the second video. It's going to play slightly differently because I'm now just sharing my screen, but there will be some audio. If anyone can't hear the audio, please can you let me uh, know straight away? Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is how we can apply connections quickly to this model. So I'm going to apply a connections via the connection vault. So just put a couple on here. We'll show you a couple of uh, new tools or a new tool that's been added uh, in advanced deal uh, 2020. So we're just going to put a base plate joint on call this BP1. So we want to, if we're quoting for a job, we want to get um, that quote as accurate as possible. So I can put a connection on. I mean, rather than joint copying around, if I select the joint box, like I've just done there, and right click, we have a new tool called Propagate Joint. And what that will do is that will look for items with exactly the same section size and exactly the same model role. So the section size of this is a 305, 305, 118, and the model role is column. All the other columns in here are also a 305 and model role column. So what that has done is that has copied that base plate around and it's now linked them together. So that's called BP1. I can't change any of its properties because it's linked to this original joint in here. So if I change this joint, all of these will update automatically. Now, this connection is very, very good. There are some scenarios where you have to be a little bit careful with it. And I am going to explain that now. So the next one is going to be my Eve's Haunch to Flange connection. Now, that's not the best. So we'll go into the library. And we will choose something that gives me a better starting point. So we'll just put on here something like this, an east haunch flush end plate. That looks reasonable. Uh, what we'll do, what we should always do is, I know I'm going to have some clashes, so I'm going to deselect a few of these items and that transversal beam in there. And we are going to clash check that. Now I do have a clash check or a clash where the system, and now looking at it, the system will actually check that that bolt is long enough to get in and out. So those bolts down at the bottom there are way too low. So I don't want to propagate this round yet because I'll propagate the issue round and I'll end up with uh, that clash 16 times. So we'll literally just change the bolt groups. We'll make this something like 200. That'll do. Now, when we propagate, what the system is looking for is it's looking for this item here, which is a 305, 305 with a model roll column. And it's looking for 305, 165-40UB with a model roll rafter. It will only put a joint on if it finds both of those things and they all have to be identical. So for that type of connection, an east haunch to a flange, the propagate is going to work fine. And now I have all my rafter connections in there. The same for my apex connection. Again, we got we can see in there 
that that bolt is going to cause a problem. I should name it, so we'll call this connection, call it C-2 for connection 2. I'll go and name the other one. Uh, so what we'll do in here is we'll say that one is three lines of bolts at 90 centers, but we're going to start at about 70. And this one is just going to be one line of bolts, but that's going to start about 150. That'll put it nicely in the middle there. Uh, and again, that will do. Now for this um, connection, we can propagate this because it's looking for an item of this and an item of that with the same model rolls and things. We can very quickly just, if we need to, let's just do a class check there, make sure it's not fallen down. So class check found no errors. I didn't name uh, this joint in here. A bit pressed for time today, so I'm probably not going to get, we're going to call that C1. Now we're going to look at the, oh, I've got a bit of a problem there. I might need to go and uh, adjust my Perlin centers. So that end distance, we need to maybe make that 300. Pull that back up. Uh, the rafter. Maybe even 350. Again, copy that to the right hand side. The connections for these we do need to be a little bit careful with if we are propagating. Uh, and let me explain why that is. The one thing I need to do is save this file, so just give me one second. Okay, so we've saved that. Now, if we go to put a uh, connection on in here, we will just use a single purlin plate between those two items. That will put it on as we want it. If we wanted to, we could then start to come in here and let's say we needed a bigger overhang. We could start to put a bigger overhang on there. I will call this C3. Now, if I propagated that, I would get an error because what it's looking for, this is looking for a main member called uh, 3051640 called rafter. And it's looking for a secondary beam of a Thomas panels called cold roll Perlin. So it would put it all up here. But what it would also do is it would put one connection on between this rafter and this right hand purlin and a separate connection between this rafter and this left hand purlin. So I'd end up with two connections on top of each other here, which I don't want because in that situation I want a double purlin connection. So with the propagate, it's looking at the section size and the model roll and they have to be identical. But it is also looking at what it can see on the screen. So if I hide those items and I propagate the joint, it will propagate. Now, the reason it's only propagated to certain areas is it's also looking at where the end of the system line of these beams are. So it's not propagated it to the middle. So it's done it to the ends of everything. That's fine. That's not a problem. What we can do we can come in here and we can say create a joint in a joint group. And this one, if I, and I learned this the other day, uh, if we go to the extended modeling tab, you want to see the joint box, select an item that is controlled by the joint dialogue, click display and that will show you the joint box. 
we go to that joint box, because you need to be able to see the joint box to propagate, I've manually put that in the group C3. If I select this and propagate, it will now propagate the ones in the middle of the beam. So sometimes the code for the propagate gets confused with what it's trying to do, but that has now put all my connections on in there. They're all in one big group. So if I change, I've only got effectively three joints in my model, but if I change one of them, everything is going to update for me. But you'll notice now that I've turned everything back on, I don't have a joint in here because the propagate will only work with what it sees on the screen. So this means that I can come in here now and I can add my double purling connection. So this one is going to have the same parameters, but we'll call this C4 because it's a double. We might want to turn on uh, the stays and things like that. But I can now propagate this one because this is looking for the two beams as an input. So you can see it's now having to think a little bit more because we have a main beam and we have two secondary beam beams. So it's having to check that everywhere in the model. And if we weren't sure, what we could have done is we could have uh, isolated all the areas that we needed to, isolated all the beams that we needed to propagate this joint on. So if you're uh, certain that um, it's not going to go wrong and the, the system, there's no way of the system misinterpreting what you want, then propagate works well. So base plates, um, column to rafter connections, apex connections, these, other types of connection where you've got one beam connecting into another beam and the model rolls are slightly different and things like that, then uh, we need to have a look at it. It has gone a bit wrong in here. So I think because I've got both rafters showing, it's put in an extra joint on where we don't need it. So the propagate in most scenarios works quite well, but you can see in there and that will have done it everywhere. Uh, so it might be easier for me to propagate this on just the left hand side of the roof because I am going to undo that. So just show the left hand side of the roof uh, and then propagate and then do the right hand side as a separate uh, entity with everything hidden. Uh, so as with anything, once you've applied your connections, I would class check everything and double check everything. Uh, but with the structure designer and the propagate connection, we can get to this point where we could, in theory, I'm, like I said, I'm pressed for time today, so I'm just going to run the numbering on what we've got at the moment. I haven't got all the connections on, but if we had some standard connections and some library entries set up combined with the propagate, it just allows us to very, very quickly create the model and then we can run a material list for our estimating department with the tonnages. And then this gives me total lengths and total tonnages all done within sort of 20 minutes it might take a little bit long to put all the connections on but even if we just wanted to do tonnages with no connections on that's probably going to be quicker than your estimating department trying to uh, work it all out now the final thing that we could do if we were doing this for estimating and you wanted rather you know you would give the um, your client uh, maybe a couple of drawings and a quote of what you're going to supply. If you want to actually give them uh, a model to view in a web browser, I'm just going to turn my joint boxes off. I have already done a class uh, in the BIMUP conference for this uh, called sharing your advanced deal models via a browser, tablet or mobile. We would go to the collaborate tab, click the shared views button. And then I would say do a new shared view click share, 
that will upload that model to the cloud, but it will also give me a link to open in a web browser so that when we're putting the quote or we're doing the tendering, we can make ourselves stand out from everyone else by giving them a model that they can interact with and they can actually see what it's going to look like. So if we spent a little bit more time, we could model the walls in, we could model the cladding in, um, and then we can give them a link. So uh, once that link has been created, I'll open it up so everyone can see uh, what it looks like. Okay, so our shared view is complete. If we click the shared views dialog and bring it back up again, and we refresh this, you'll see that we've got our builder barn. If I click that, it will open it in a web browser. and it takes me straight there. We can see our shared, we can spin round, we can zoom in, we can, I've done a whole session on this, so this is, uh, but we can go into first person mode, we can start having a look round. This will work on, it's probably better if you actually have a concrete slab in there to stand on, but this will work on web browser, mobile or tablet. We can then click the share button, copy the link, and just put that in our email when we're sending out our, uh, our tender. Okay, I'm just going to just go back to sharing the PowerPoint very, very quickly. Um, and I'm going to take you to this slide here. Uh, so again, you should now all um, see a link at the bottom of that page under sharing your model. You should see uh, a line that says if anyone wants to have a look at the model online, please click here. If you click on that, that will actually open the link in a web browser and you can interact with that model through your web browser. Um, so I'll leave it on the screen for uh, 20 or 30 seconds. So you guys have got the option to click on it. Um, and that takes us to the end of the session. So again, apologies for the technical issues. Uh, like I said, it's the first time we've used Teams for a webinar, so we did think there'd be a few teasing issues. Uh, I think we got there towards the end. Um, and the last thing I'm going to run, I'm just going to run one more poll for everyone. So if anyone does have any questions, um, please type them in. I'm just going to launch a poll to see, um, do you have the power pack? Um, do you have it installed? Do you use it? Do you have it installed and use it infrequently? Um, are you entitled to it, but don't have it installed? Um, or do you not have access to the power pack at all? So if you could answer that poll for me, please. I'll leave it there for a few more seconds. I will close the poll there. Um, haven't seen any questions come through, but thank you very much for joining me today. Obviously, you can follow us. Um, online you can follow me online john and alec um, and hopefully um, you will be able to, on that last slide there where you've got the twitter logo the facebook the linkedin and the youtube logo 
you will be able to click on those to take you to the obviously the Grey Tech social media sites. So again, I'll leave that there for a few minutes if anyone wants to click on those links to open them in the web browser. Um, but that is all from me today. Uh, and I hope that everyone can join us on the next webinars. For the advanced users, please make sure you sign up for our UK user group in September. It will be an online event. And so make sure you don't miss out there.